drop this my conference will now be recorded. When when's the first Monday of the new year? Does anybody know? Hang on, I'll check. Thank you. Um, first it's, Monday uh, is the seventh. First Monday? No, when is the first fifth Monday of the new year? Oh. None in, doesn't look like any in January. None in February. Nor March. No March. No yeah. March. Yeah, it looks like April. Yeah. Okay. Book it, Professor. That fifth Monday of April. April 29th. April, April 29th. Okay. Okay. It's still around. Um, don't I'm talk like that. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm not, I'm not listening to that type of talk. No, I'm joking. I, of course, I will of course, be. Of course, you will be. Um, all right. I'll tell you who I can see on this call, and uh, we'll go from there. I can see Jake. I can see Rich Jackson, uh, Bill Burhans, Carl Foreman, Dennis Correa, Dick Bailey, John Appler, Len Sierra, Paul Frieda, Sylvester Mann, Les Shelder, Paul Frieda, and Peter Kafka. Did I miss anyone? I think you got them all. Good. Okay. So, um, Dick Bailey, you that's a new name to me. Have you ever been with us before? I was uh, on the last Monday that you had a Monday one, but I didn't have my computer set up to do the camera or the video oh. or the talk. Ah, oh, okay. Well, then maybe my memory is bad. And um, yes, I do remember. Yes, you did. Uh, 67 Cougar. Right. Yeah, because Les was going to introduce me, but you never got to that point. So that's right. So we'll we'll do that now because I actually owned a '67 Cougar. It was the best car I ever had. Is hey, that, Bill, you, welcome. <laughs> do you do you do you have a '67 Cougar? I did have a '67 Cougar, but I have a '67 Shelby Mustang and a 2007 Shelby Mustang. Whoa, okay. I'd rather have the 67 with no offense to the to the 2007, if you don't mind. Well, well mine was a 302 um, three-speed stick on the floor, my 67. Yeah. And it was, it was a coupe, and I bought it in 1974 when I was at uh, in grad school in Chicago and I, I loved that car I wish I had it today it was a fabulous car anyway um we can't talk about cars keep well I don't know Dennis Korea can talk about cars for a while more Dennis did you ever have a 67 Cougar or a 67 or one of those early Fords of any sort no, uh, just my 66 Shelby 427 Cobra. Oh, okay. <laughs> no longer on it, sold it two years ago. <laughs> okay. We have an elite uh, group here tonight. We do. We do. Two Shelby, two Shelby owners on the same call. That's very... Uh -oh. I won't mention my 1965 Rambler Ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> that was my okay. first one. <laughs> Thank you, Jake. Okay, but I tell you what, I bet you, I bet you wish you had it today. It would be worth a few bucks. Oh, I do. Yeah, it, it was. It was a fun car. It, it was kind of cool because of the, uh, the the front seat, <laughs> the, or the passenger side seat, would collapse on its own. And that was really great when you're on a date. It would, it would fall backwards. <laughs> that was in the days when you could make a bed out of out of a car out of the car seats. Remember them? And uh, yeah, this one fell. Seat. This one fell on its own accord. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I see. Um, how about how about Rich Jackson? You must have had a pretty. You must have had some fancy cars in your youth. 
Um, 72 Lotus Align. Oh, oh, oh nice. what do you woo? <laughs> The, the serial number was J011. Wow. wow. Oh my gosh. That was the VIN. That was the VIN. And you're still paying for it, right? <laughs> no, and so that one disappeared years ago, but no. I had well, to take it... my shoes off to drive it. Yeah. I was gonna ask, had you ever fit into it? That that's a car that you wear. You don't you don't sit in it, you wear it. <laughs> was That's it, it. You, was you put it on. Was it painted um, white and olive or yellow and olive? No, nah, this was this was pure white. It was uh, the hard top. Okay. All right. Well, let's um, we 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 will stop. I'll, I'll I have to impose this on myself, no one else. Um, but. Um, Let's um, let's start with uh, with Richard Bailey, who I know is um, is a buddy of Les Shelderu. Um Richard, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, your background, where you're from, how old you are, um, how you're being treated, and um, uh, where you're being treated, and then maybe from there we can get into a little bit of a discussion about maybe how we can support you. Well, I'm in Davenport, Iowa. I've been living there pretty much all my life, other than when I was in a service. I was diagnosed in uh, April after many years of my PSA climbing by normal uh, physicals. My doctor finally sent me over to Urology Associates in Davenport here. I'm being treated by Dr. Harb which I don't know if anybody's heard of him. He's pretty well known around our area. Uh, they did the biopsy and I had uh, seven of the 12 came out as nines, four plus five nines. And uh, they, Dr. Harb started me on hormones in May. And I was doing that and my PSA dropped immediately. It, was, it started out at 24.8. Went to 1.2, then to 3.8, and then it started climbing just a little bit. 0.76, uh, 0.88, and 1.3. So Dr. Harb is going to start me next month on uh, the immunotherapy, the Provenge. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what else I can really say. It's kind of a shock, but we're getting through it. Other than the hot flashes are like driving like crazy, but. Right. So let let me let me just clarify um a few things. Okay. Um so first of all, um how old are you? Um Richard? I'm sorry, I'm sixty-eight. Okay. Um so are you a uh are you a ninety you must be a nineteen fifty baby. I am February. Okay. okay, me too. All right. Um, and um, you um, you're seeing Dr. Arbadio urology. Seven out of your twelve cores were Gleason nine. Was that was that four plus five or five plus four or both? Four plus five. Four plus five. Good. Yep. Okay. Um, and um, what was your PSA on diagnosis? 24.8? That's what the uh, urology did when I did my first lab there. At my normal doctor in uh, last December, it was 4.4. Uh, 4. Mm -hmm. And he suggested I need to go get checked. And when I went to the urology, and that was in May that they did the. the PSA level there and it was 24.8. Okay, so that, that's actually very helpful because that tells us that um, your PSA went from um, from 
24 to 24.8 over about five months, five or six months. And I do have a metastatic spot on my spine on T5 that they, okay. we haven't started. Uh, we talked to radiologists once and we're supposed to set up another appointment to talk to them what our next course of action is on that. At okay. that point, when we talked to him a few months ago, he said the only course of action would be if I was having pain or discomfort or something, which I'm not. So I don't know what our course of action will be on that. That's one thing that we're kind of in limbo about. Sure. Yeah, we, we can definitely talk about spot radiation a little bit too. Um, now, you... Um, you said that the, he put you on um, he put you on Lupron or what what, what, what drugs did he uh, put you on? I'm, I'm doing Firmagon and Exgiva. The Firmagon right. is the hormone and the Exgiva is for the bones. Right. And how um, so he put you on Firmagon and Exgiva and you're still doing the Firmagon or have you yeah. switched? Okay. No, he said we'll um, stay on that for now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's probably the best that's there. Um, the only, the only difference is that some of the other drugs, now that you've been on Firmagon, you could switch to them. They do much the same thing, and you just don't have to get it every month. But if you're getting an Exceva shot on a regular basis, it, it doesn't make a lot of difference anyway. And let me just review for everybody what your PSA has done um, since. So you said that... Um, Right after you started, um, it dropped right down to what level? 1.2. And it went, that was the within a month. month went to, what, next month, it went to 1.2. And then uh, two months later, it did a 0.3. And then two months after that, it went to 0.76. And then he started doing every month because it had gone up just a little bit. And then it went in November, it went to 0.8. And then the end of November, it was 1.3. Okay. Okay. And so I, I think we got, we got that picture. And so now what he's saying to you is that you're a good candidate for Prevenge. Yes, and I'm going to start that in January. My first appointment is my... Leukophoresis is in January, and then the three days later, I'll do the infusion. Okay, and again, we can answer questions about Prevenge. Um, what sort of doctor is Dr. Harb? What type of doctor is he? He's a urologist. He takes care of most of the advanced uh, cases in our area. It's okay. basically what specializes in is advanced. Um, and um, has he talked to you about adding any um, anything beyond the Provenge? Has he talked to you about either chemotherapy or second line antiandrogens? Uh, no chemo whatsoever because. Since it's outside of the prostate, they're saying no, no chemo probably at all. Uh, he did say something about a new drug that's coming out the first of the year, and I didn't get the name of it yet. I was talking to him last two weeks ago, but he said it's coming out at the first of the year, and he said I'd be a candidate for that. It's not like it's a pill, but I said I don't know what it is yet. So... I'm not quite sure what he means when he says because it's out of the prostate, no chemotherapy. I, I could understand him saying no surgery or no radiation, which is also very debatable. But uh, it, no chemotherapy does not make any sense. I okay. mean, it's not that you would have to have chemotherapy, but it should be considered as an option and be presented to you. Okay. Um, okay. We're, we're, we'll get into this a, li a, a little bit, and there are some good people on this call who have had similar experience very recently. Um, do you have any cancer history in your family? Well, I found out my father had prostate cancer, and he didn't even do any treatment for it at all, as we found out. So, 
Uh-huh. And did he, is he still alive or did he pass? No, he passed away from a heart condition. Okay. Okay. And um, how about on your mother's side? Do you have any cancer? Uh, not that I know of, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, all right. Um, bef- I, I, I think I'm just going to let, I mean, I think there's enough there that um, I'll let some of the guys come in and then maybe I can try and pull some of these um, strands together at the end. And, and why, why don't I start with, um, I mean, the people that immediately come to mind who I think should should talk to Dick a little bit are Len, um, who had a very similar diagnosis to you, um, and Carl Foreman, who has a current diagnosis very similar to yours. Um, and then I'm sure there's a bunch more people, Peter and others, who would like to talk to you. So let, let me let me kick off with Len. Okay, Dick. Um, as, as Rick said, I, I am also a Gleason 9. I had six of six cores positive, uh, high volume cancer. And like you, I was put on Firmagon with no, no radiation, at least at first, no radiation and no surgery. Um, unfortunately for you, you seem to become castrate resistant fairly quickly. Most guys will get at least a year uh, out of um, Firmagon or Lupron before they have to use the second line antiandrogens. As Rick mentioned, are you familiar with that term antiandrogen and what we're talking about? Yes, I've done some research, so. Yeah, okay. Um, Have you had any uh, gene sequencing done or did the doc recommend it? No, he didn't say anything about that yet. You might want, to talk to me. might want to talk to me about that. Okay. And um, I, I guess we can move on to whoever, whoever else you want to go to next, Rick. We can't hear you, Rick. I muted myself because I was just eating something. Um, uh, Len, why don't you address with Dick your decision to progress to radiation, since you also were Gleason 9 and, and, you know, although I don't think you had a clear metastasis, you were suspect. Yes, um, there were no visible bone nets, but I did have lymph node involvement, pelvic lymph node, and what uh, Sloan Kettering referred to as probable um, bladder invasion. So who knows if that's considered metastatic or not. But um, my first oncologist at Sloan Kettering felt that uh, I would not have benefited from surgery or radiation, uh, but I spoke to others, second and third opinions, and they said, oh, absolutely, you should. Uh, you'd be a good candidate for radiation, um, even if it's just as a debulking, low probability of cure, of course. Um, So I did get, um, when it looked like I was becoming castrate resistant, uh, uh, maybe 18 months later, um, I did undergo radiation and uh, that drove my PSA down to 0.1. And I was able to go off hormone therapy for, uh, well, I'm still off at the moment. Uh, so it's been like 18 months. It was definitely beneficial for me, the radiation, and it may very well be for you as, as well. Carl, do, do, you want to, um, do you want to talk a little bit about your situation and, and how your decisions, I mean, obviously, your bracket positive, so that sort of adds another wrinkle that Dick doesn't need to really consider, at least at this point, until he has more knowledge. But I'm more interested in your decision, given that you were metastatic, to go on the trial you went on. 
Sure. Um, I am uh, 64 years old, just turned 64 last month in November. I had been followed by my urologist for a number of years. I was having a rising PSA and uh, it started accelerating uh, relatively quickly. I had a, my biopsy in early June. I did some research relating to the biopsies. I found out that the there's something called an MRI fusion guided biopsy, which is more, more accurate, apparently more accurate than the standard biopsy that's done in a urologist office. 12 out of 16 uh, cores positive uh, for cancer. And um, I had two different pathology reports. The initial one at the hospital, which I had the biopsy at, at Capital Health, in, and I live in New Jersey, central New Jersey, said that my Gleason score was a 7, 8. My urologist recommended I get a second opinion from Johns Hopkins, Dr. Epstein, and Dr. Epstein came back with uh, a, a worse score of 9, 10. Uh, my initial oncologist that was came highly recommended does, was not concerned at all. He was uh, talking about watchful waiting, not going on to any kind of medications. But um, I, I, I have done and will continue to do a tremendous amount of research for my own benefit and making sure that the doctors are setting me in, on the right path. Um, I also have had, we talked briefly uh, about genetic testing. I thought that also was a key for me. Uh, and that's where it was determined that I was total surprise. I, I was BRCA2 positive. Nothing on either my father's side or my mother's side that would have led me to believe that that could have been a possibility. But uh, not to go into that in any great detail, but now I know that there's a, a, another course of action treatment potentially that I am pursuing. And I am actually meeting uh, on Wednesday. I'm going to University of Pennsylvania and meeting with Dr. Dumchek at the recommendation of this forum with, with Rick and Len, uh, who is one of the top researchers for men uh, and, and actually women who have the BRCA2 gene. So I'm anxious to, to have that meeting in two days. Um, a month ago, I had a prostatectomy. I am in a clinical trial called SimCap. It is for recently diagnosed metastatic prostate patients with high volume. And uh, the initial course of treatment is to be on ADT, androgen deprivation therapy for a number of months, and then having the surgery, which is exactly what I did. Um, when uh, After I had my biopsy in June, the end of the, at the end of that month, I started on a 30-day shot of Firmagon. Um, what was added a month after that was uh, Zytiga with prednisone. And also interesting, this is my newer or my current oncologist, who at the time recommended uh, right away that I go on docetaxel for chemotherapy. And my initial reaction was, oh, do I really want to start that right out of the gate? And in my performing my research, uh, I, I had found uh, that uh, the Zytiga had been uh, determined to be just as effective as chemotherapy. And I discussed that with my oncologist. He said, well, let me get back to you. And two days later, later he said, I agree, we're going to put you on Zytiga with uh, prednisone. My, uh, the high of my uh, PSA was 20, uh, just right before I had the biopsy on June 8th. My PSA is now down to 0 0.12. Um, I am going back in a couple of weeks, uh, again, a month since I've had my prostatectomy on November 14th, had the catheter in for a week. And the purpose of the SimCap trial is to determine that uh, for those of us, us who are metastatic, that hopefully there is a survival or extended survival benefit for having the surgery uh, subsequently after having androgen deprivation therapy. The, the general rule of thumb, those of us who are metastatic, is not generally to have um, uh, surgery. But uh, in my opinion and the opinion of, of, of the staff at the, at the Cancer Institute that I am going to on a regular basis is that this will hopefully benefit me and other people in the future, those of us who participate in clinical trials, that it's not only about uh, ourselves, but it's about the bigger picture as well. And that's why I decided to join the trial. Thanks, thank you very much. I just want to, I want to identify the callers that have, um, joined us just to make sure we don't have any other new men. Um, 
for, for everybody. So uh, we have three people that are on the telephone that haven't identified. Would they be, would they like to do so? This is Nazir Ahmed. Oh, Nazir. Oh, hello, Nazir. This is well, Bill. Hey, hey, hey. Number, oh, hold on, N-A-Z-I-R, yeah, number six. Welcome. You're just trying uh, to keep you. me away, Rick. <laughs> and who else do we have on the telephone? Um, Jay Kerr in San Francisco. <laughs> Jay, just just uh, say that again, Jay, so we get the number. Jay Curran, uh, San Francisco, California. Got, you got it, Jake? Yep. And we have one more person on the telephone. Yeah, uh, that's Dan from San Francisco. Hello, Dan. Hi, Greg. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll spend about another 10 to 15 minutes. Peter, um, I would ask you to address with Dick um, the issues around his um his his current quarterback and um and maybe expose dick a little bit to the to the choice of doctors that um would, would you could you do that for us sure you know, i was thinking i was thinking of everything what what part of iowa are you living in uh davenport over on the east side it was Davenport on the east side. Okay. Yeah. Um, immediately, what came to mind was uh, you've got somewhat advanced disease, and you probably want a good medical oncologist who specializes in prostate cancer to work with you. Um, you know, just, just in some of your comments about what medications you're taking and what you're looking at and so forth. It, it just occurred to me that, that you probably want to go beyond even a even the urologist you have, even though the she, I, I assume, um, is is working with advanced disease. You might want a good medical oncologist, especially in prostate work. They're called Genito Urinary Medical Oncologists. G E A T U. What was that again? Genito G. I T O urinary, Nito urinary medical oncologist, and I've, I've had one from the get go. I was diagnosed like you with a high PSA and Gleason nine. I immediately went on on hormone treatment, but um, my medical oncologist has been with me for five years now, and. Um, following me every step and um and you and you want a good one and later on when i have a chance to speak i'll describe even more why it's good to have a good one but um there are some i don't know about eastern iowa i, I know there's one um in omaha luke dr nordquist in uh, yeah. omaha yeah flight away and then you could always go up to you know, up further north, up into um, the Chicago area, or even Mayo, and, and you'll find uh, these kind of medical oncologists. But I would suggest, you know, kind of looking around, asking, see if you can find an appointment, ask around and see if there's someone in that category who you can work with. Um, so let, let me just make a quick comment on, on, on that. Uh, remark from from Peter that um, for me the the three choices that are relatively close to you uh, relatively are um, uh, Chuck Ryan who's at the University of Minneapolis in in, in Minnesota um, Luke Nordquist N-O-R-D-Q-U-I-S-T, who is in Omaha, Nebraska. He's not affiliated with a medical institution. He was, he was Memorial Sloan Kettering. He, he's very impressive. He knows us. 
And then um, um, at Northwestern, Alicia Morgans, A-L-I-C-I-A, -I -I Alicia Morgans at Northwestern, or at University of Chicago Hospital, Walter Stadler. And I think all three, all four of those would be excellent choices. Now, it's possible, I just don't know, the University of Iowa may have somebody. Um, I just discovered that they have a really good reputation for pancreatic cancer. Um, I don't know, I've never heard of anybody from University of Iowa, but you would need to call them and ask if they have somebody that specializes in genito urinary and then just run their resume past us and we can probably do some research with you to help you qualify them. But in terms of um, the doctors that we've mentioned, um, you would be very comfortable with all four of them and they are all good people, compassionate, easy to talk to, and very, very smart. The reason why we all are keen that you make that a decision to bring a, G, a GU med on to your team is because um, surgeons are not trained to um, to work with with um, advanced prostate cancer. They're trained for surgery, and surgery finishes pretty much after the radical prostatectomy. They involved because it's very profitable for them to be involved. It's a cash cow. And, you know, a lot of them are self taught and they don't have the background in internal medicine, which is required. So you're on a systemic treatment. For example, these hot flashes. There's a whole bunch of systemic um, remedies for, for hot flashes. They may or may not be treated. They may or may not be trained in that. They're not trained in what to do if um, if the hormone therapy affects your liver, which it can do. Um, we've had guys even recently who have had issues around their liver, um, and for for us, from what we've seen, we're very leery of leaving your quarterback as either your radiation oncologist or your surgical oncologist, which which you are now, you know, we recognize you've got some um, you've got some geographical considerations. I will tell you that both Chuck Ryan and um, Alicia Morgans are empathetic to working with surgeons, urologists because I've heard them present. And um, if you go to our website and you look under the, um, under the Prostate Cancer Resources tab, there's an excellent discussion on there, which involves both Alicia and Chuck and a couple of other docs. And they are talking about what the immediate treatment should be for a man who's diagnosed metastatic as you are. And what you'll hear them say is, knowing what we know today, that you should immediately be treated with um, a first line anti a first line ADT drug with like Vermagon, plus either a second line antiandrogen or chemotherapy. <laughs> And it's pretty much up to you, the patient, which way you want to go with those two. It's not really clear which one is better. They both have pros and cons, as you heard Carl Foreman say. But we want to expose you to that discussion because your doctor is not on it. And probably the reason she's not on it is because she doesn't deal with enough people or she just hasn't gotten that education. But you are not getting standard of care for your diagnosis today. 
and you need to bring somebody onto your team who can talk to you about about that where you actually get the treatment is a whole nother issue the likelihood is you can get that treatment locally but you've got to have somebody guiding that treatment who's a lot better educated than your current doctor so um just to take five more minutes is there anybody who would like to say anything to dick and then i want to go back to dick for for for, for questions is there anyone who who would like to add um any thoughts yeah this is Dennis korea uh dick i'm uh five years older than you but uh several years ago got my initial diagnosis and uh, unfortunately, I was metastatic uh, at the time, five mets to my lumbar, and had to make that same kind of decision. And the best I could get was from the the best uh, medical oncologist for prostate cancer down here in Tucson, where I'm at. Uh, and I did a lot of checking around, and they kept coming back to this one doc. And I went to him, and he saw I had a Gleason 9. Uh, we did a a second opinion check and they all came back everything came back the same everything was read by some other oncologists up at mayo at the time and he said well, i suggest uh we get this uh rapidly and hit it as hard as we can early on with chemo and firmagon is what i started on and then i switched after uh, several months i don't remember exactly uh to the lupron injection which you get every three months uh, but that worked real good for me for a little over a year. And then it started uh, coming back again. And then we switched to uh, added uh, Zytiga and prednisone to it. And uh, now I'm at uh, less than 0 0.1 PSA and uh, no indication of uh, anything going on at the moment. So I've got scheduled for scans again here, my annual scans coming up in uh, – Let's see, April. But just I'd, I'd let you know that's just another alternative uh, that you should definitely consider. And I have to agree with Rick and Peter about the, a good medical oncologist, uh, prostate, the, the best you can find uh, within means or close by, if that's what your, your choice is. Thanks. 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 So you, you've heard from guys that have done chemo. You've heard from guys that have done Zytiga. Um, we've got guys on here who have done, done Provenge. Provenge is good, um, but it's not curative. And now is the right time for you to get the Provenge. There's no question. It's not a bad suggestion, but you need more than just Provenge. Um, and you know we cannot give you medical advice, but you've heard from other guys with similar diagnoses who are all getting a lot more than 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 just a um, uh, an LHRH drug like Firmagon um, and, and Provenge. Um, anyone else before I go back to Dick? One more. This is this is Bill Burns. Um, go ahead, Bill. Dick, I, I think you're fairly close to uh, Iowa City, is that right? Yeah. Yes. The University of Iowa. Right. There's a national uh, designated comprehensive cancer center associated with the University of Iowa. And they have a prostate cancer program. Um, so having received the National Cancer Institute designation means that they are among the very top cancer centers in the country. And uh, so that I think would be a good place to look for a medical oncologist. They also have a, uh, according to the website, they have a, a, a support group too that you might want to look into. And Dick, um, in the chat window, I wrote Janito Urinary Medical Oncologist. So you'll you'll see it in there. And that is, you just don't you don't want just a medical oncologist. You want a Janito Urinary Medical Oncologist that specializes in prostate cancer. It's a subspecialty. So let us come back to you and 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 see if you have any 
we've given you a lot of information um and we hope you'll keep coming back to us because each time you come back it'll become a little bit clearer and you'll get opportunity to ask questions so um but but what can we help you with right now oh nothing right now i'm just getting lots of information that's very helpful and give me a course of action i guess to go forward from here okay well don't hesitate to reach out between now and um and 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 when we meet again because uh because of the calendar i'm not sure when we're going to meet again but um if you need any information in the interim drop us a line and um and, and we'll support you for sure appreciate that okay all right um so let me run down the list we got a lot of people on the call and uh, some of whom haven't been on the call for a very long time and um, can give us a quick um uh, a quick update uh let me just make sure do we have anybody else that's yes we have somebody else on the telephone who hasn't identified who is that I think that, that was uh, John Apple uh, back in. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Thank you. I'm, oh, I'm very happy to have you back in as John Apple. Oh, we got Larry Fish on here who snuck in when I wasn't looking. Um, I had a feeling you might have done that to me, Larry. All right. I'm going to go Rick, down. Rick, before yes. you go on, were you asking about a fifth Monday in December? I was asking when the next fifth Monday was. There is one in December. I don't know what the hell I was doing. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, Sorry. but it's yeah, but it's New Year's Eve. Oh, okay. All okay. right. Okay. I don't think we'll get a big crew on New Year's Eve, Jake. <laughs> I don't know. Unless Jake, unless you want to put on a hat and some sparkles and you and you want to throw streamers you know um nah, and entertain us then we may we, we might do if i do that then nobody will ever come back <laughs> okay okay um all right so let me let me start since i i've got your attention jake is there anything you'd like to talk about tonight uh no was that a no that was a no yeah i'm sorry okay um rich rich jackson anything you'd like to talk about i think he dropped off oh yeah i think he did too i saw that um professor bill you've got to give us an you got to give these guys an update and tell them where you are so i'm volunteering you okay, okay. carl yeah, I'm, um, I'm uh if i can do that sooner than later that would be i can hear that you're not well i hope i didn't infect you i hope that wasn't from my visit um carl no. is there anything you'd like to update on today? yes yes okay um dennis anything for you no uh john appler anything for you i'm fine rick thanks Okay, Len, would you like to talk some uh, talk at all tonight? Yeah, a little bit. If we have time, you can put me at the end. Okay, well, we'll we'll figure out how we're going to do this when I see Paul Frieder. Anything for you? Nothing for me tonight. Thanks. Okay, Sylvester. Anything for you? No, thank you. Okay, um, Les Childerwood. Anything for you? Uh, no, thanks. Okay. Um, Peter, anything for you? Yeah, just a, a couple of questions around the CBC report. Okay. Um, Mr. Franklin, anything for you, sir? Uh, no, I, I'm not going to be on too long tonight, but I'm just going to listen in oh. for a little while. Okay. And uh, um, my, my first car was a 1960 Plymouth Belvedere, so. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, Ken Anderson, what was your first car? Ken? Fifty-nine. Fifty-nine. What? Chevy panel wagon. Oh, okay. Um, we're doing good here. Um, would think, you like any time tonight? Uh, thank you very much. I'm good. Just hanging yeah. out in the in the rain. Okay. Yeah, I know. We just got some here too. Um, Nazir, you can give these guys a quick five minute update if you don't mind, since you haven't been on the call for well over a year, maybe longer. Yes, yes I, have. I have not been there. Okay. Yes, you're right. Um, we'll come back to you. Dan Louie, anything for you tonight? Yeah, a quick question or two. Okay. Jay, Jay Curran, anything for you tonight? Yes. Okay, and Larry Fish, anything for you? No, I'm okay, thank you, Rick. Okay, and d did I cover everybody or did I miss anyone? Good, okay, so here's the situation, guys. We've got an hour and 10 minutes. Actually, I need about three or four minutes at the back end just to talk about logistics. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So everybody is going to have to limit themselves to about 10 minutes max or less. Okay, is that a deal? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, let, let William, go first, uh, Grant. Yes, I am. William. I'm so sorry to hear that you're sick. I want to share with everybody that I spent 48 wonderful hours in the company of, um, of Bill, of Professor Bill and his lovely wife, Deb, and um, was sad to leave, but um, I will see them again soon. Bill, let every, give everybody a quick update on, on where you are and how you're doing. <laughs> okay, I am not doing very well, at least in terms of the, I caught a really bad cold right after you left. It wasn't you. I mean, you were healthy as a horse, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, we had a, a wonderful visit. I was really happy to see Rick and we had a class. Um, so uh, I thought I would just bring everybody up to date. I think the, the most important news for me recently has been that I uh, learned uh, what the, uh, I obtained some genetic information about my uh, tumors. So just a brief reminder, I'm uh, castrate resistant and uh, metastatic and have been for uh, four or five years. And uh, and recently, I participated in a clinical trial at Dana-Farber that involved uh, sequencing DNA from tumor cells in, uh, that were recovered from one of my lymph nodes. And the uh, results that I learned about about uh, two weeks ago, although I haven't actually seen the report yet, this was I'm going to tell you information that I learned over the phone from my oncologist at Dana-Farber. So I guess the, the two most important findings were that first of all, um, the androgen receptor gene in tumor cells has been amplified 113 times, which is just extraordinary. So uh, normally there are two copies of this gene in all of your in in your prostate cells in, in all of your cells, but in uh, in my tumor cells, it was uh, amplified to this extraordinarily high number, and what that means is that um, it makes it those cells much more sensitive to androgen. So this is why I became castrate resistant. Um, having all those extra copies of the androgen receptor gene um, and 
for those of you who don't know, the uh, androgen, the importance of the androgen receptor um, in prostate cancer is that it's the protein that uh, testosterone and other androgens binds to that uh, triggers the growth of these cells. So if you have more copies of this protein, uh, then the androgen receptor or the uh, testosterone and other androgens are able to uh, launch a much more robust uh, proliferative response in those cells. The other important finding um, was that, as I think um, a lot of you know, my tumor was caused by a mutation in uh, BRCA2 gene, similar to Carl. And, um, and that made it possible for me to be treated with a drug that specifically targets that mutation, a drug in a class of drugs called PARP inhibitors. And I was treated with these drugs for uh, a total of about three years. And they did a fantastic job of knocking down my disease until about a year ago when I became resistant to uh, this particular drug. And so the other interesting finding from sequencing my uh, tumor cell DNA was that these cells had suffered an additional mutation that basically functionally eliminated the mutation in the BRCA2 gene. And so now, instead of having a, a defective BRCA2 protein, so the BRCA2 protein is involved in uh, maintaining the stability of uh, genes in, in uh, cells. Um, and when it's defective, um, they're much more likely to mutate. And but they are, the, you know, they are sensitive to this particular class of drugs. But now because of this second mutation called a reversion mutation, um, those cells are no longer sensitive to, the, to this class of drugs. So um, basically these two findings explain why I'm castrate resistant, meaning that I'm no longer sensitive to, uh, to the uh, depressed levels of testosterone and other androgens that I was initially. And it also explains why I'm no longer uh, sensitive to PARP inhibitors. Um, there were some other uh, mutations identified in the sequencing. Um, the Probably the most uh, important ones were an inactivating mutation in a gene called uh, TP53 which is another gene that's involved in stabilizing genetic information. And uh, TP53 is mutated in the vast majority of all cancers. So I, I, for uh, some of you don't, I should probably tell you that uh, those of you that don't know that I'm actually a cancer geneticist. So I'm giving you information that um, hopefully it's not uh, too complicated, but um, the reason why I'm giving you such specific information is because this is what I've worked with throughout my career. So the TP53 gene was mutated, not a surprise because it's so frequently mutated in all types of uh, tumors, and it helps to explain why my, uh, the, my particular tumor is so aggressive. And the second interesting mutation uh, or the, the next interesting mutation is in a gene called P10, which is also involved in, in uh, stabilizing the genome. And uh, when it's mutated, it can lead to um, a, a more robust proliferative response. And uh, sorry, it's the other way around, a less robust proliferative response. And so, uh, the, uh, this mutation also helps to explain why my tumor is so aggressive. 
unfortunately, I mean, the, the one, one of the reasons why it's important for any of us that have advanced prostate cancer to have their tumor cell DNA sequenced is that it makes it possible to, uh, it, it opens the door to the possibility, I guess I, is a better way to put it, that um, the sequencing might identify a mutation that can be um, used as a hook to treat your tumor with drugs that target that those specific mutations. So, um, in other words, they're actionable mutations. And um, unfortunately, the um, the mutations in TP53 and in P10 are probably not actionable at this point, meaning that there aren't any drugs that are particularly effective, although that may be changing and I need to do a little research or, or some re recent reports that indicate that perhaps there are some uh, drugs that can target uh, mutations in these two genes. But then the other mutations that were identified were um, more clearly um, in other genes that I won't talk about were uh, clearly not actionable with drugs, and so they're not going to help me um, identify, uh, you know, a, uh, a new therapy in the future. Um, okay. Although that could change if drugs are developed uh, in the near future to uh, target mutations in those genes. So and that's very, very report. briefly, Bill. Um, you. You've done three, um, no, you've done two dose attacks, or you're about to do a third, and you have your sights on another clinical trial at Dana Farber. Right. I'm so the, the dose attacks treatment is going well. I'm uh, I responded exceptionally well, meaning probably in the top five to ten percent of all patients in terms of the extent to which those attacks will knock down my uh, disease. And, uh, and so I will have another uh, two or three uh, treatments with those attacks before we move on to the next treatment. The next treatment uh, probably will be another clinical trial at Dana-Farber that will test the um, efficacy of a drug that targets a protein called CHECK1. I was in a clinical trial over the summer, beginning last spring, at Dana-Farber that was testing the efficacy of a drug that targeted a different uh, protein called ATR, which functions just upstream of CHECK1. And uh, unfortunately, that it, it didn't turn out to be uh, terribly effective. It was somewhat effective in knocking back my disease, but uh, the larger problem was that it also knocked out my white blood cells. And so um, right. because of that, I had to withdraw from the trial in September. Right, and, for, and, and, uh, and uh, I'm sorry? And, and we should add that, um, that that trial also involved the PARP inhibitor and relied on the BRCA2 mutation, and we now know that that BRCA2 mutation was mutating, so that may be another reason why it, it didn't work as well. Bill, I got to move on. We'd let you, as you know, we could talk to you for the the whole evening, but um, I've got to keep my yeah, eye on the clock tonight. And you have to get to bed because you don't sound great. Well, so, yeah. Well, thank you for letting me go first. I'm. I'm going to try to hang in here for a little bit while longer in case I can. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm sorry I didn't. Uh, if are there any very pressing questions for Bill? Just one quick one, Rick. Um, uh, Bill, being that you have so many copies of the AR, does Bipolar androgen therapy make any sense, or did you discuss that with anyone? No, I it it might, Len. I have to. Um, uh, I haven't even thought about it to tell you the truth. 
but uh, yeah, it's something that I will, I definitely need to explore. But no one has raised that uh, possibility. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, I also I also had a number of questions. I guess I only had one question to cover before Bill talking about his situation, which is similar to mine. And there's a number of questions I have for Bill. Maybe I can do it offline afterwards, Bill, if I could get your contact information. But because I am having my meeting with Dr. Dumchek on Wednesday, you might be able to help me into what type of questions I should be asking her since she is also a genetic uh, researcher specifically relating to the BRCA2 gene. And I have been looking at PARP inhibitors, but those are still, they're not yet FDA approved. So I was curious that you've already been on it for three years. So that must have been, I would assume it's part of the trial, but I didn't want to spend much more time well, on it. Well, let's address that because it's important. And, and I would like Bill to, to lay out a couple of questions um, that you might want to ask. Um, what we have found, our experience has been that if you are BRCA um, positive, that um, even though the PARP inhibitors are not um, approved for prostate cancer yet, and there is no pan cancer approval for BRCA2, but most insurance companies have been pretty good about covering you for a PARP inhibitor. So my guess is that you could probably get your insurance company to pay for a PARP inhibitor, which one I'm not sure, because the three that I'm aware of are all sort of various strengths. Um, and I think if you've got a good doctor, um, you should be able to access that PARP inhibitor. The bigger question uh, is when when's the right time to start taking a PARP inhibitor and uh, and, the, and probably one of the best people in the country to answer that question is Bill. Um, Bill, do you, do you want to give some um, um, some guidance to, to Carl for when he goes to see, um, he goes down to Basser on, on, on Wednesday? So, Carl, I think that there really isn't an answer to that question. When is the best time? Uh, because no one really knows. But um, but I think that from uh, what I know about your case, my feeling is that now would be a good time to uh, to start a PARP inhibitor. The the inhibitor I was on was a Laparib, which is the first PARP that was. Uh, you know, used in the clinic in uh, breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And it's quite effective. It worked well for me. But if you can uh, latch on to one of the next generation PARP inhibitors, um, in general, they're much more effective at, uh, at least in, you know, in, in, ex in experimental systems. And so, uh, you know, that uh, any of those would work well for you. Why don't let's plan to talk? Why don't you um, get my contact information from Rick and then uh, give me a call at some point before you have your meeting? I'd be happy to answer the other questions that you have. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Um, okay, Carl, I'll um, I'll put Bill's telephone number in the um, in the chat window directly to you in, in in a moment. Why don't you take a few minutes, um, five minutes or so, to talk about um, uh, what other questions you might have? Okay, I just narrowed it down pretty much to one question. Uh, I've been on Zytiga, as I mentioned earlier. I, I'm, I've been on it for I think about five months now, and I just got my my latest 30 day supply, and it was automatically given to me as the new generic, and that is by a pharmaceutical company called Apotek, A P O T E K, and. Um, I actually sent on, as we were speaking here earlier, I did send an email to my oncologist. I said, well, is this okay, the generic? I think generics are supposed to be exactly the same as the original or not, but I, I, it was given to me without any uh, input by me or my doctor that the pharmacy just sent it to me. So I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to deflect that. I'm going to deflect that straight to Len. 
Len? He's back. He's yeah, back. Sorry, guys. I was muted. So, yes, um, theoretically, generics are equivalent to the originator's drug. Um, however, you should know that the FDA will approve a generic as long as the uh, blood levels are plus or minus 20% of the stated uh, concentration. So in other words, if you have, uh, if you're taking 1,000 milligrams of... Um, Zytiga, yeah. Zytiga, thanks. Um, it could, the actual value could be anywhere between 800 and 1,200, and the FDA would approve that. Uh-oh. So I mean, yeah, I would, it's, it might be worth fighting to see if you can get the uh, the brand drug rather than the uh, generic. But, you know, having said that, uh, with drug costs being as high as they are, your insurance company may balk at that. Yeah, well, it's interesting with the pharmacy. I went online to see that the retail price of Zytiga is $10,200 per month, and the retail price for the generic is 8300 So. Not much of a savings, in my opinion, but you know they switched me to that. I would. Yeah. My, my recommendation, Carl, also would be to try to fight it to get okay. the, the brand name. Yeah. And and maybe you will succeed based on uh, you know the fact that it's not that much less expensive. Okay. And Len, um, I mean, this is this is a problem you yourself could be facing before very long. You're right. And what would you do? <laughs> um, I, I'd probably fight for the uh, brand name. Okay. But, you know, I, on the other hand, if if it didn't, uh, if I wasn't successful, I wouldn't panic. Right. Mm -hmm. It's going to the the, the, uh, the generic is going to have an effect. It just okay. may not be as potent as the. Uh, as the brand name and carl as you may know <clears throat> there are a lot of people experimenting right now with taking one quarter of the dose of zytiga with uh, a low-fat meal instead of taking it on an empty stomach and supposedly it, it uh, yields uh, 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 equivalent uh, effectiveness yes i've read that now yeah yeah yeah, and we, we know people that have, do, have done that, and there's a lot of good evidence, clinical evidence on that too. So it's, it's I think the it's supposedly four times the potency, if, if my memory serves me right, if you take it with food. Yeah. Because it, it's processed through the liver. Okay, so Carl, what was your next question? Uh, well, I, I I think I've used up my five minutes. I know there are a lot more people, but I, Bill, I do have your phone number, 716 area code. What part of the country? Is that East Coast? <laughs> uh, yes, that's in uh, upstate New York. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, I'll probably talk to you sometime tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> Terrific. Yeah, okay. I'll look forward to your call. Thanks. Um, thanks. Just for, uh, just for your information, I posted a link on in the chat box. Um, the FDA has approved the, the Apotex generic and it is apparently biochemically equivalent to extent to uh, Zytiga. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, that's um we'll we'll look does it say anything about the dosage? Well, my dosage is uh, four tablets of 250 milligrams each for, in both cases it's the same dosage. For yeah, the same dosage. Okay. Yeah, they're the same, yeah. Okay. Um, so um, let's um, let me keep moving down. Len, take a little bit of time. Okay, so <clears throat> I will be scanned with uh, the Axiomen scan this Friday. Okay. Uh, just to recap, my my PSA has been rising, and its last reading was 0 0.82. It was the third successive increase. Um, so 
<clears throat> we, we need to see what's going on. So I have the Axiom and Scan scheduled uh, Friday. Now, so the question I guess I'd like to throw open to you guys is, um, should I also um, go out to San Francisco and do what Peter did and have the Gallium PSMA scan uh, just um, as a comparator to see what the two scans, how the two scans uh, compare to each other and, and what they reveal? Um, Peter. Yeah. Peter, what's your opinion? I well, I would I'd be curious to see what the Axman scan picks up at at a PSA of uh, of one or around one, because usually it, they want it to be. So it'll be. I don't I don't know I don't know what to say. If you don't pick up anything, I'd for sure go with a with a gallium scan. Yeah, yeah, that's. But it's that's if, you can hold, if you can hold the place in line. For the other one and you can always cancel it do that uh, yeah that that was my plan uh, and and uh right so if the action scan came negative i definitely would uh, go out to san francisco for the gallium scan um now will, it's your, positive. Insurance, will your insurance pay for both one well the they'll pay for axiomen the gallium scan is part of a clinical trial Okay. Um, but I would have to pay about nine hundred dollars. Is that right, Peter? That's what they that's what they tell you, but depending on your insurance, I didn't have to pay a dime other than my oh. plane ticket for there and back. Okay. I it up. That's good news. And 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 Len, are you for the um, Gallium 68 at uh, UCSF, have you heard back from them? Yes, I finally did get um, an email from Raven Smith, the clinical trial coordinator. And um, she said that if I was willing to uh, go with the, the PET MRI as opposed to the PET CT, that she could get me in at the end of January as opposed to the end of February, if I went with PET CT. So I mean, I would rather go with the PET MRI because that should be uh, even more sensitive. Okay, okay. I'm not sure of the pros and cons. Sometime we need educating on the difference in scanning between a PET MRI and a PET CT. I know the PET CT, well, they're both gonna pick up soft tissue, right? Yes. Uh, but my understanding is there's a general consensus that PET MRI is better than PET CT, plus PET MRI is a lot less uh, radiation. Okay. Exposure. Sounds, sounds to me like... Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, is there any radiation with the PET MRI? Well, I guess there's radiation from the the gallium, but um, but not from the MRI. No. Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody anybody like to follow up on the um, on that with Len? Personally, I think it would be fascinating to see the two comparisons, you know, compared side by side. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, but. Uh, yeah. <laughs> For those of you who like scans, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Of course, of course, there's uh, radiation from it. Sorry, I wasn't. I was a brain fart. I wasn't thinking. Yeah, um, that's the first I've heard of the PET MRI. It's interesting. I'm 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 just thinking about Jake's comment. We can't get him out of the house, and he's he he wants everybody to travel all over the world <laughs> to, get, to get hands. Easy for you to say, Mr. Hannum. It is very easy to say. <laughs> do, do as I say, not as I do, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. Um, 
Well, I'm going to keep this rolling along and, you know, we may finish up with time at the back end, which would be great. And we can come back and spend some more time with uh, on this on this Bracker issue, which is fascinating to me personally. Um, Peter, um, if there's no one else that wants to say anything to to Len, um, let's hear what your questions are tonight. Okay, just this work, but I, I could uh, my uh, my he my hemoglobin took a precipitous drop this month. Um, it had been eleven point one for a few months, uh, and then it just dropped down to ten point four. Uh, my uh, Dr. Turner, my medical just was right as soon as he got the results. Um, he, he was he called and. Asked if there's any change, you know, particularly is there blood in my urine, blood in my stools, and so forth, um, which which is negative at this point to my my uh, site. Um, but I did I did take the report into my general practitioner today to see if I could follow up on it because it, um, I can feel the difference. I mean, I can feel more fatigue recently. And, um, Ten point four is the lowest my Hemoglobin's been. Uh, my my whites have gone up, but my red my red blood count uh, and hematocrit have gone down as long as well as the hemoglobin. So I don't know. I don't know what it's in, indicative. Of. There it is. Um. So you um any anybody have any thoughts on what might drive Peter down from eleven point? to 10.4. I mean, I, I do know that um, typically um, they will consider giving you an infusion under 10 um, and they'll require you if you're eight or below. But I've many men to get infusions when they sort of hit that 10 level and they felt much better from the infusion. Um, I think in your case, Peter, the question is, what's changed um, to to make this happen? Um, my my guess, I'm, I'm not a doc, um, as, as you all know, and we don't give advice, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if it isn't something that is related to the amount of radiation, the radiation you just did and the the fact that the radiation might have suppressed your bone marrow um, because it's not unusual to see hemoglobin drop um, as a result of radiation. But uh, anybody got any inputs? Well, I think that just the hormone therapy alone, Peter, could uh, cause your hemoglobin to be dropping. Uh, when I was on hormone therapy, my uh my hemoglobin dropped from 14 to 12. no that was over it wasn't a period of just a couple of months but um closer to a couple of years um so and, and that was just um that was just firmagon not zytiga so you know you have further testosterone suppression with zytiga which of course uh, will have bone marrow uh, suppression effects also. As far as what Rick said regarding the uh, bone marrow suppression, I don't know how close the bone was to where they were radiating. I'm thinking probably not. Uh, the other contributing factor could be maybe you were excessively hydrated, which would um, tend to uh, thin out your blood a little bit. Other than that, I, I I suspect it's the hormone therapy. Yeah, and that's 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 what, what occurred, that's what occurred to me. And I'm thinking of I'm think I'm supposed to stop. I'm supposed to back off from it in a couple of weeks, and I'm thinking of maybe stopping it early, doing myself a Christmas present of of uh, getting off the Zytiga next week instead of January. Mm -hmm. Um, just Zytiga or Zytiga and the LA and the LHR? Either. Well, yeah, the Lupron 
on the three month shot could end in mid mid January. Okay. Okay. Um, we're getting a lot of feedback from you. Maybe you can turn your volume down a little bit. Um, anybody else like to um, like to talk to Peter? Yeah, I was just going to say it might just be an an anomaly. Um, you know, my blood counts kind of jump around. One month they're normal, then the next month they're low, and then they go back up again and close to normal. Um, they never stay consistently low. So it may very well, you may very well, re, you know, re, uh, rebound, Peter. If it's only been, if it's only one reading. Well, my my hemoglobin's been in the eleven range for 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 several years. Eleven it was eleven point six in May, eleven point uh, eight, eleven point one, eleven point one. So this this month it did the the drop. So I don't know. I can feel the difference. Didn't you just start the Zytiga? No, this is nine, 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 nine months, ten months into it. Oh. Eleven months into it. Well, but like I'm saying, all I was saying was, if it's only one reading, it may just be an anomaly. It may very well bounce back next month. Good. I do another blood test after the first of the year. I just want to report in. I don't. I'll let you know if I find anything more out. Okay. Um, Peter, the only other thing I would say is uh, from 11.1 .1 to 10.4, whilst it's a drop, is is not a, a precipitous drop. So, um, you know, it's it, it, but it is a difference. I mean, I've seen guys whose hemoglobin moves a lot more than that over shorter periods. When was the last time you had your your blood drawn for a CBC? I do it every month. Okay. Every month. So you know, over a month it's not huge, but 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 it's enough. The only other thing that is interesting to me is that you said your white count went up and your and your red count went down. And I just wonder whether that's an indication that you're fighting some sort of a an infection somewhere. And but that's really what Turner should 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 be an expert on. Right. Yeah. Get any help, help locally? I will turn that direction for sure. Okay. Um, and anyone else before we 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 move on? Okay. So let's. Um, we've got half an hour. Three guys still to 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 touch base with. Um, along with visiting Bill. I was fortunate enough to see my old friend Nazir Ahmed, who we've been supporting on and off um, for three or four years now, even though Nazir hasn't been on the call for quite a long time. Um, I hear from him fairly regularly, and um, the, Nazir lives just across the border in Canada, so he he was kind enough to drive over and spend some time with us and bring some very delicious Indian food uh, that his wife had prepared that we all ate together. Um, and um, Nazir is is faced with um, a slightly rising um, PSA. He's just becoming hormone resistant. Um, he did docetaxel quite a long time ago, and he's been on PS. He's been on um, um, an LHRH drug, um, Zolodex, for quite a good period of time, and his PSA is now creeping up. It went from 0.34 in August to 0.82 in November, and I think what what uh, I don't want to put words into Nizir's mouth, but based on our discussion, the question is, what does he do next and when does he do it? Um, and that is a question we talk about on here quite often. Um, Nazir, would you like to add anything to that um, uh, before we hear from the guys? Yes. Oh, yes, I would like to. And I would like to appreciate their 
opinion and information on the uh, axiom and uh, scan. I called various places, and it is rather expensive, 10,000 Canadian dollars to get, a, to get a scan done. And the number that you gave me, I called them, and they, they said, no, sorry, we don't provide any uh, financial assistance in getting uh, the ex human scan, but you can try different places. So uh, with that information, I would like to ask anyone where I can get a cheaper scan than $10,000. Do you, guys, those of you who have looked at the Gallium 68 in uh, UCSF, um, is that available if you're a Canadian or is that or, or not? No, it's not. As far as I'm concerned, it's not available, nor is the ax, axiom, ax, axiom has can available here. Yes. Yeah, it's not. not yes. None of these, but I called uh, various places, and the cheapest I can get is ten thousand and dollar for this scan. I was just wondering, is there any site which may be able, may have put five thousand dollars that I can go and get that done? Well, UCSF doesn't say anything about having to be an American citizen to take the trial. I don't see why oh. you can't apply. Okay. If it's Gallium 68 on trial, I don't think they they discriminate based on uh, country of origin. That's just my okay, guess. I don't have this question. How do I join that uh, that trial? Len? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, well, I can forward the information that I was just sent uh, by the clinical trial coordinator over there to Nazir or to you, Rick, and then you can forward to Nazir since I don't have his contact info. I'm about to put his contact info in the chat window directly okay. to you, uh, Mr. Sierra, and um, and so you can forward that to him. And, and what we're talking about is a trial that's going on at UCSF for Gallium 68. Um, PSMA, which is a slightly better um, scan than the Axiomin scan anyway. And uh, as far as we know, the cost is around $900 um, US dollars. And of course, you have to get yourself to uh, to San Francisco, but I'm sure your wife wouldn't mind if you took her along. <laughs> um, and um, and we, you know, I can we can talk about that separately. But seriously, um, you know, we um, we've sent a bunch of guys over there. And, um, and 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 Len is talking to them right now. Peter has done that scan, um, and so you, you may be eligible. And as 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 we said before, you could get that done in January with the PET MRI, which sounds to me to be a reasonable alternative. Um, so. Um, so that that is a a possible solution. Um, yes, I think so. As to where you could get that done um, less expensive, I really don't know. I mean, if Axiomin, if the Axiomin people themselves cannot direct you, I I don't know. I just don't know where else. Um, I don't have any bright ideas. Does anybody else have any ideas other than the the um, the the scan the 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 uh, G sixty eight scan? Well, uh, I, depending upon where Nazir is in Canada, I guess the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Uh, of course, they have the the, the choline scan. Right. Which, uh, but that's considered to be less sensitive than 
gallium 68. Right. I, actually, I think it may even be considered less sensitive than maximum. Uh, it is, yeah. The C, the C yeah. I, I, I'm not sure it's it, it's it's that um, expert, and, and we could probably get you a deal on that in Phoenix as well from Almeida. Um, Almeida's Almeida's doing some scans, um, but you know he's doing he has a trial with gallium sixty eight. I don't know how um, fully is, but you might want to check with him too, Nazir. Um, yeah, I will check with him. With, can with I Pablo ask you a Almeida. question? Yes. Can ahead. I ask you a question? Uh, you're saying that the PSMA scan is uh, superior to the X human scan? Yes. Then I'll go for the PSMA because it's only nine hundred dollars, and I can go and get that one done wherever it's available. Well, why why don't you try that? Um, I know for sure that um, Almeida is also trialing a PSMA scan, gallium sixty eight PSMA scan. He's just using a different agent than the PSMA agent that they're using at, in San Francisco. And I don't know the availability, but if you if you draw a blank, then um, think about, um, Len, when you, when you send the information to, um, um, to Nazir, can you give him the contact information for, um, for Almeida? Do you, do you have it? I, I don't have that. Okay. All right. I'll I'll send you. I'll send Nazir the the information for Almeida as well in Phoenix. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And Nazir, one other one other thing is your doctor is going to be, have to be the requester. You can't request the scan yourself. So you, it's okay. Very, yes. Simple one page form. It doesn't you know it takes them five minutes to do, but. The doc, your doctor has to request the trial scan. Yes, I will go and speak to him if he would be kind enough to do that for me. Okay. Nazir, you, also, you sound sick too. Are, are you okay? You, no, uh, sometimes I, I still have that effect of that cold that I had a month and a half ago. Oh, and okay. sometimes it comes back and it, and it goes back again. Comes and okay. goes. All right. But well, I'm okay. getting worried because I'm wondering what's in the pipeline for me after I saw you and I saw Professor Bill. I hope, uh, I hope I'm not going to come down with a cold this week. Um, okay. Um, why don't you go there and then come back again um, soon and we'll talk about this issue around when to intervene because it's a concern to me that your um your doctor Levesque in 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 uh, the walker center in canada um is is reluctant to to do anything at this point in time and um i'd like to open that up to the guys but let's do that maybe next week or the next time we meet yes certainly thank you okay um all right um any is, was there any other input before i move on to dan louis okay dan your floor you got 10 minutes okay i think it will be much shorter thank you rick um as you know i'm under um i'm taking chemotherapy now i've gone through four sessions of doxotaxel it wasn't working so the doctor decided to change it to a combination of cabotaxel and uh, carboplatinum. First two was okay, the PSA was dropping, but with the third one back on December 4th, uh, I had a reaction, severe allergic reaction. Um, and so they decided to stop that. But the problem is tomorrow I'm scheduled for some scans. The oncologist says uh, after three sessions, he wants to take some scans. Well, I actually only took two with um, two sessions of the combination. And and the last one being the third one was not successful. So I'm wondering, so why take a, 
is it is it wise to go ahead with the scans? Will it prove any uh, anything a uh, can be a can be gained from the scans tomorrow? Uh, they'll they'll be CT scans. Right. Um, well, a couple of things come to mind immediately. Um, the first is that we really don't know what it was that you responded badly to, whether it was the carboplatin or the cabazitaxel or the combination of the two, correct? Um, well, the sequence is first they administered the cabazitaxel, and okay. then after that is infused, then, then comes the uh, carboplatin. The first two sessions I had worked out okay, but with the third one, uh, I had a I uh, had a flush face, a swelling, a redness, breathing problems. So they decided to stop administering the cabazitaxel and go ahead with the carboplatin. Okay. Uh, so, so it was likely the it was likely the um, cabazitaxel that caused that caused the problem. Yeah, this was the same reaction I had when I had first started to take on the docetaxel because I had the same feeling and at that time they decided to instead of a full flow meter it out accordingly like a quarter flow increase right. to a half flow and then a full flow for the remainder of that uh, for the under docetaxel but um, just wondering if it would be of anything accomplished with scans tomorrow because I didn't take get all three three complete uh, chemo sessions. Well, uh, first of all, and, and t tell us what your PSA, what your PSA has done, Dan. Um, with the combination, it's been going down. Uh, it's been dropping uh, almost half. Um, I, the sequence was in October, early October. It was over 400. It jumped up a little bit to 472. But with the combination um, chemotherapy, uh, in November, it dropped down to 267. And on December 4th, it dropped down to 138. So it's been dropping significantly with the um, well, combination. And when was the last time you scanned? Uh, let me can you, let me double check. I'll be right here in a second. OK. May, when was the last scan? Just out of curiosity, while he's looking for his results, what do they do when you have an allergic reaction to chemo? Do they um, give you an antihistamine or what? Yes, they did. They um, they decided to stop the flow and then uh, give some additional um, antihistamine, like uh, yeah, they which they administered. And that works. That works immediately. Uh, well, um, this is me. Okay, I'm here. Um, the first time, the very first chemo, this happened within five minutes. And so they, they waited one hour. They gave him um, Benadryl. And they waited one hour, and then they decided to re-challenge going slowly at a slower rate. I thought they were going to do the same because he did the same thing this time with Capacitaxel. It was fine the first two times, but the third time, for some reason, he started flushing again and, you know, shortness of breath. And so they had to stop it immediately. But this time, I think because of the time and they didn't want to stay late. So they decided that they just said, they we don't re-challenge. This was at Mission Bay. This was at a step at, at a different place. At uh, Mount Zion, the first time, they they were willing to re-challenge the same, the same day you know, after one hour. But this time it was at Mission Bay and they said, oh, we don't re-challenge here. But I think it was because it was already 5.30 and they didn't want to stay late. So they said, we don't do it on the same day. So they did not do it. So I thought they were gonna reschedule a week later, but instead they said, no, we can still administer uh, the carbo plan. So that's what they did for 30 minutes. And then they released him. And okay. So let me let let me ask you, Dan. When was the last time you scanned? Um, I think it was in September. Uh, yes, it was in September. 
And when is and what is the plan for your next treatment? Well, are you are you going to try both cabazitaxel and 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 carboplatin again? Are, you, uh, are they are they going to change yeah, the state? To, yeah. The, the nurse practitioners, uh, when we asked what what was going to happen, she just said we're going to rechallenge you. You know. At, on December 26th, and that means, you know, no, no cabazitaxel for six weeks. But, um, but we were, we thought Dr. Agawa would have gotten in touch with us, but he never did. And so um, he has again mm -hmm. scheduled, but I really don't see the sense in doing it until if they said that they usually like to do it after three treatments. Well, he didn't get the third treatment. Well, so I, you know, well, look, there's, sure. there's a couple of things here. One, have you have you reached out to to Dr. Agarwal? Um, yes. And yes. he hasn't responded. Well, Dan took a long time to write to him, and you know he didn't res he hasn't had a chance to really respond that fast. And so I don't even know if he even knows the situation that that he he scheduled for September December 26 because normally you have to have a doctor. Uh, um, may May I, I I I have to keep it keep you fairly succinct here because we've still got another person to go through. What what on on December 26th. What is it that you expect Dan to get? Um, they said they're going to, I don't know. They said they're going to read challenge. So I assume they're going to give him the capacitaxel and the carboplatin at the same time. Okay. So, uh, so, but you said that they don't do, so I thought you said they wanted a six week break. It seems to me, I, I can only tell you what I would do. I, I would, reach out to Dr. Agarwal again, both by telephone and by, um, and with um, the, um, the my chart. And um, I would tell him that you're not clear about what's going to happen next. Are you going to get both drugs? Are they going to give you the cabazitaxel at a different pace? Because that seemed to be what succeeded with the docetaxel. And you've got to clarify that. Now, there's no reason why if you get scanned tomorrow, you couldn't get scanned again. Um, you can get scanned as frequently as they want to scan you. Uh, I would think it probably does make some sense. I mean, you got you got three you got three doses of carboplatin and two doses of cabazitaxel, so it's going to give you an indicator as to which way you're going, and your PSA has gone down significantly. So I don't know that I I personally see the harm. Um, in getting scanned tomorrow if you want to get scanned. If not, go through one more session and get scanned after that. But anybody else want to add anything? No? Okay. What do you think? <laughs> oh, go ahead, Jay. Um. It could be that things are just falling through the cracks and that that scan for tomorrow is just left over from the way they had scheduled it uh, weeks ago. And they don't don't know the other things that have happened. Well, the question is, since you have it, since you have it scheduled, would you take it? Would you take it, Jay? Yes. How about other people on the call? Would they take it or would they wait? I would take it 
because it might give you an early Christmas present. You might see a reduction in Mets there if your PSA is dropping that much. Give you some, okay. give you some optimism going into the new year. Yes, I I, uh, I agree with you, with that thought. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, you know, you've got. If it were me, I would probably take it too because. I've gotten, I mean, I got, I've gotten a fair amount of chemo into my system in this combination, and I've seen some results on the PSA, and it might be very um, encouraging to me if I did see a nice drop. And if I didn't see a nice drop, I could figure it was because I hadn't done it. I needed a little bit more, and so you get another scan after you've come. How many sessions are they talking about giving you, Dan? Uh, it's undefined as of yet. It's just going to continue on until the uh, PSA is at a relatively low, lowest amount, I gather. Right. So, you know, so then you get another scan after you've done another three. Couple with that with another blood test or two, and we'll see the effects of the uh, combination plus uh, with the scan results, we'll tell the, uh, what the outcome is, hopefully. Right. Um, so, I, you know, I, if it, I think if it were us on this call, we would probably, most of us would, would take it and not let it slide by. Um, how are you doing yourself? How do you feel? How's your head? And how are you responding other than the, at the time of the infusion? How have you been tolerating the capacitaxel and the carboplatin? Very well. Uh, they Couple with that, I've also been given Nulasta, which is a uh, bone strengthening, bone strengthening device, or whatever it is. But anyway, okay. I've had to, I've had two blood transfusions because I was very fatigued and very listless and very uh, under uh, not un, and with lacking energy. So I'm right. people said that I'm looking much better now with a little bit more vitality. Good. And and how low did your hemoglobin get? Uh, I think it was eight point something, but um, okay, you know, it's around okay. nine something now. Yeah, that that sounds that sounds well. And how's your granddaughter? More, most important. <laughs> oh, grandson. Grand, grandson. He's grandson, very uh, me. attentive to us. Good. Good, good, yeah. good, good, good. Well, that, that, just, that's just to let you ahead. know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I haven't, I haven't gotten any exgiva shots because my WB white blood cells have been very no, low. No, it's not oh, because but, of that. Oh, sorry. Your calcium. My calcium is very low. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I think they want to make sure that it's gone up higher. Then they can administer a, a, some exgiva shots. I've been it's long overdue for me at this time. Okay, and what what have you have you tested your um have you tested your D three recently? Um no um hasn't been ordered. We forgot to ask, and only Dr. Abrams ordered that. So um, okay, well anybody can order it. So you need to insist on getting a D three hydroxy twenty five test, and my guess is your D is very low. How much D are you taking? To, uh, no, 500. OK, so you could be taking 10,000. You can take up to 50,000 oh, a day. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The calcium, he's taking 500. But the D, I think he is taking the 5,000 every day, uh, the 2,000 every day. OK, well, check your D and then adjust it if it's low. Okay, that's not medical advice, by the way. That's what we, I do, and we all do. We know we got to get our D up in D three up into a, that right level. So we check it, and then you can just take you can take that supplement. Um, it's it's safe, as I'm sure Dr. Abrams has told you, up to pretty high doses. So you just add a little bit more and hope that you're going to come close. I agree. 
I think my 10 minutes is up, out, um, Rick. I'll let okay. you get their time in. But thank okay, you. Thank, and you. thank you, Dan. Um, any, anyone else want to say anything last to Dan before we go to Jay? Okay, Jay, you got the rest of the call. Well, um, saw my nurse practitioner today. Uh, PSA is over um, 1,100, and they um, offered me chemo and um, something else in a trial, which I think is Xtandi and something else in a trial, and I couldn't hardly pronounce it. Ends in MAB or something like that. But I think I'm going to do what I talked about before, go to a Dr. Lee up in Santa Rosa and do bat. I talked to him about five days ago and I liked what he said. Okay. And so you're uh, you're taking it uh, once a month and it gets down in the last week so there's hardly anything. And then because you're on uh, Firmagon, um, that's the opposite of the high testosterone, and then starts over again. So uh, have, you, have you discussed BAT, BAT, bipolar antigen therapy with Agawal? Yeah, I just, he uh, said a few months ago, why would you uh, pour gasoline on a burning fire? OK. And did you tell him that um, there are certain people like like Sam Denmead at Johns Hopkins, who thinks that it produces results? I believe I mentioned that. Okay. Um, look, it's, you know, every doctor to his own. Um, I mean, my own feeling is that, that my own thought is that um, at some point, um, you probably have got to do some chemotherapy. And um, whilst we don't know how good bipolar androgen therapy is going to be, and you may be a good candidate, and you may have the type of amplification that Bill talked about um, when they tested, when they sequenced him, you may not. But when your PSA is as high as 1100, um, I don't know that you want to be messing around for a couple of months to see if the BAT works before you've tried some chemotherapy. And um, at some point, you can ask that. I mean, Dan is um, a very good example. Dan Louie, I mean, who put chemo off forever and a day, but eventually he recognized he had to do the chemo. Um, it's hard for me to comment on trial because we don't know what it involves and what the drugs are. But we do know what the chemotherapy is, and we do know that for a lot of men, it, it can have an impact. And if it doesn't, it can be adjusted as it was in Dan's case, and then it can have an impact. So um, I think that whilst the BAT may not be a bad alternative, the chemotherapy is, is, is a more reliable course. Does anybody else want to comment on that or add to that? No? All I can, all I can say is I kind of agree with you, Rick. You know, the BAT with, with that high of a PSA, like Agarwal says, you know, that's pouring gasoline on a fire. That might be too high of a testosterone, testosterone level for a high PSA. How about some of you who have been reluctant to try chemotherapy um, and your PSA has really started to get high and you've changed your minds? Any, 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 any uh, ABC people would like to say something? Um, this is Dan again. It, it really ain't so bad, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's um, it, it's just a expect you, you have expectations that it's going to be painful and you have the worst of it. But 
you know, you have to brave yourself and just say, look, it's got to be done if you want to stick around because you can't just deny it. Um, you have to commit yourself to do it and do it with full, uh, with full thought without any reservations. That's my, that's my take on that. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, any, any other, uh, by the way, those of you who don't know what ABC is, it's anything but chemo. And, um, and there were, um, you know, it's, there's been a lot of guys that are ABC and, 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 and Bob is one of those, uh, Jay is one of those that, that that's in, has always been in the ABC camp. Um, anyone else want to, want to say anything to Jay? I, I would want to, I would want to talk to people that have been through BAT successfully and, um, I, I don't, I've never met anybody that's, you know, that came, you know, went into it and uh, had a great success story yet, but I've, there's very few people that have done it, but I would want to talk to people. Well, I pointed out, I think last time, John Nidecker, who ran the uh, support group daytime on Tuesdays at UCSF. His has dropped from 1,000 to 500, PSA. I talked to him. Okay. Okay. And, and, he, and he, did the, he did the BAT with, with this guy, Lee, in, in um, um, Santa Rosa, Santa Rosa right? California. Um, you know, even dropping to 500 is good, but hopefully we'd get a, you know, we, we'd like to see a better response from that. And um, I don't know. I mean, that's, I don't. I think I, I, he, I, uh, I, yeah. I forget how many cycles he's done, but it's probably less than four months. Okay. Uh, they um, did offer to have my uh, starting chemo rather than be 75, be 60. I don't know if that would make that much difference or not. Well, you know, I mean, there's no, there's no harm in, in trying a, a lighter dose in it. Um, you know, take a first one full dose and then if you don't respond well, but, you know, I, I was just with Bill in Buffalo and um, he's, he's bearing up really well. No neuropathy, no problem with his with his nails, his hair is a little wispy, um, but he still has some. Um, I mean, he doesn't have that thick foot, thick head of hair that he had, but he will do again six months from now. Uh, I just, I don't know, I don't know what to say. I, I just feel like, um, like the chemotherapy is what we know, and for some men it can be very successful and it could knock the disease right back. And, um, but there again, I was willing to do chemotherapy when I was first diagnosed. It probably wouldn't have been right, but if that's what they wanted to give me, that's what I would have taken. So everybody is, is very different. You know, my concern is, Jay, that if you don't do it now, you, you know, you, you may well need it at some point in the future. What do you think of my backup plan with uh, LU-177? Well, you can't get the LU-177 until you've done some chemo. That's no, why I, think I, can get, I, can, I can get it out of Australia or India or South Africa. I think it's foolish if you want. All right. Because I think there's a good reason why they want you to have done chemo. I mean, you know, there's a reason why they don't just make you do chemo just to put you through the ringer. I mean, there's a reason why all of these trials um, and, you know, ask you to do chemo and why some of them have shown success based on chemo. Okay. And, and you know, to keep fighting the chemo and, and putting yourself through... Um, 
putting yourself, making yourself jump through hoops in order to get the Lutetia 177. But what do I think about it? I think it's a good plan, but I think it's going to be a much better plan if you've done chemo first. And I guess you can always quit chemo. You can always quit chemo. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I weigh in? for? I know we're late, but just to say a word. Of course you can, Larry. Of course you can. So, uh, so, hi, I'm one of those people who uh, had a bad, very bad time with chemo. Um, I did it early and I could only do three of the six, six sessions. And I had bad nails, bad skin reactions, neuropathy that hasn't gone away. And I stopped. But, but you know, I'm glad I did those three sessions. I don't know how effective they were or weren't, but my PSA has been low for going. I'm on a Lupron therapy, but I've been going on between three and four years. I'm still okay. Um, and if I had to try another chemo, I would. I would. And my my suggestion would be, since it tends to be cumulative, why don't you start it? The first one was no problem at all. The second one, I had some fever. The third one, I started to get bad reactions. And if you're getting a very bad reaction, if it's really tough for you, then you could switch to plan B. But if it's, mm -hmm. you can get through six sessions without like some terrible side effects, no hospitalizations, no, like, so, you know, they give you new last, they give you something for nausea. They weren't that terrible. If you get through it, I think you could get years and years of benefit from that. And then these lutetium 177 and other new stuff might really become mainstream at that point rather than some far out thing that you're going to try instead. So I don't see why you wouldn't want to at least give it a go. And this is somebody who is almost a point. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. I, you know, that's, that's, that's good input. Anybody else have any similar input or, or the other side? Or wouldn't do chemo? Well, I'm, I'm also an eating but um, I was more intrigued by the clinical trial Jay mentioned uh, with, well, he said it was enzalutamide with something that ended in MAB, which I think was probably nivolumab, which is Opdivo. So it's an immunotherapy. And at the uh, PCRI conference uh, this September, Dr. Turner, talked about enzalutamide having immunomodulatory uh, properties and that yes. they, were combining, they were combining it with yep. immunotherapies. So I, me personally, I would go that route, but that's because I'm ABC. That, that's uh, it, was, it was a ahead, phase John. one trial. So I guess it's just they're testing effectiveness or something in that in that trial uh let's see did he tell you if it was at bristol myers no they didn't uh i we don't have time but i could go get some paperwork oh, on it but uh, it's out in the so car the one i'm looking at is a phase two no this is not phase two for the for the new drug it was not okay um Again, you know, we can't comment because we're not really sure what that trial was, but you can call me or you can call Len. We can talk that Thank through. You. Thank you. Um, um, for, for, for sure. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know what to say, but I think that, that the chemotherapy, at least starting it, is a very viable option for a lot of us on the call, even those of us who are ABC. And I, and the and the trial they offered you may also have some legs if it is what Len thinks it is. So I remember um, I I have a Lupron brain, and I remember asking a nurse practitioner what regime it was under. Was it immunotherapy? And I said, it's not surgery. We know it's not that. 
but I forget the answer, and I don't want to take any more time. Trying to okay, was this, was this Nurse Ratchet? <laughs> Out of respect for me, I'm not going to say anything about that. <laughs> okay, well, you know, I, I, I just have to say, and I, I can't say it enough times, guys, don't speak to nurse practitioners when you've got such important decisions. Yeah, and I, you have I have to it. ahead of time and insist. And if the doctor's not going to be there, you say, "Okay, I'll switch my appointment." I have a telephone conference. I have a telephone call. It's going to be end of the week with Doctor Agor. Okay, I mean, don't rely on nurse practitioners. I will refrain from making a comment about Nurse Ratchet, but just don't be seeing nurse practitioners unless it is a routine appointment. I just cannot tell you how strongly I feel about that. Really important. And you know, and if you insist on doing it, don't come crying over spilt milk because you've heard it enough time from us and 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 frankly you sh you guys should know better and if you are going to see a nurse practitioner at UCSF there is a very good one you've got to avoid nurse you know just avoid nurse ratchet okay guys we've we're, we're only about 11 minutes over there is a um logistics issue um, next Tuesday is Christmas Day, so we will not hold a call. And then the following Monday is the fifth Monday, so we don't hold a call on the fifth Monday. Um, so um, I don't think that we are due again to meet until January. Let's see, it would be the first Monday in January, which is the 7th. So um, this is probably about the longest we will have gone. It's going to be 13, 20 days until the next meeting. Um, unless there is a, a real desire, and we can probably fit a meeting in, I'm happy to make myself available. We could fit fit a meeting in um maybe on on the fifth monday new year's eve early in the day i'd be happy to do it but um i, I you know i need some feedback if you guys are all happy about waiting until the seventh that's fine and um you can also you know prevail upon upon us and we'll support you the best we can, um, Peter, Len, myself. Any any uh, any suggestions? Any any comments? I wait till the seventh, and uh, everybody okay. have a happy holiday season. And... Okay. Yes, that of course we wish you all. Um, anyone else? Okay. Rick, don't forget to send me Nazir's uh, email. I put it in the chat window, Len. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Got it. Okay. okay. All right, guys. So I wish you all. Um, I I will probably notices between now and the end of the year don't forget that we are you know to include us in your charitable giving plans between now and the end of the year um we've we've sent out and we'll be sending out a couple of reminders on that uh we don't do a general appeal um more than just at the end of the year so please respond um, if you feel that you've got some benefit from us during the course of this year, add us to your charitable giving plans. Um, and I wish you all a very, very happy holiday season and more important, a very happy and, and healthy new year. Yes. Happy new year, everybody. Happy holidays, everybody. Season Thank you. Thank you.
see and I expect Aye. to see you all next year. I I do too. Thank you, Larry. Okay, good night everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.